We're going to pray, and um, because to be able to sit and hear the Word of God is a tremendous privilege and, uh, and should never be taken lightly. It's God's Word. You haven't gathered to hear what I've got to say. Um, you've gathered to hear what God has got to say, and rightly so. But the, our God is the King of Kings, and He's the Lord of Lords. He's Almighty God. He's the Wonderful Counselor. He's the Prince of Peace. He's the Everlasting One. He's the Eternal Father. He's the Creator of Heaven and Earth, the Alpha and the Omega, the Beginning and the End. And so, God, we, we stand before you humbly, and we just say, Lord, speak to us. Speak to us, Lord, and help us to obey. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> title of the message uh, today is the habitation of God. Let's say that, the habitation of God. I've used that title for over 30 years so many times. I need to, uh, you know, but it says it all really, the habitation of God. Let's say that one more time, the habitation of God. Our text is Philippians chapter 1, verses 27 to 28, Philippians Chapter 1, verses 27 to 28, and uh, let's uh, read um, together. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. Let's read it together again. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. Well, it's a visionary Sunday in January over the last 30 plus years, um, January has been our month where we look at the vision uh, of the church. Vision is really important for a group of people because without vision, what happens? We perish. Or without vision, we cast off restraint. It's important that for any group of people that they have vision, that they have focus, else they will, not be able to, they will not know where they are going. Usually, every Sunday we take in January to look at the vision, but this, this year we're only going to take this Sunday um, in, in particular. The context of our text is this. Paul is writing to the church in Philippi. The original member of the church in Philippi was a woman called Lydia, um, who was a merchant, and he found her when he visited that city on the bank of a river outside the city. And, the, and with her were a number of other women. And he preached to her and to her companions and told them about Jesus. And they became Christians. Her, fam her family got saved. And she asked him to stop with her, in her as he worked into the city, um, asked him to stop in her home. And people got, other people got saved in the city, even a, a jailer, someone who had responsible, responsibility for looking after prisoners, he and his family got saved. The church in Philippi was probably the first church in Europe. And Paul is writing to this church in Europe from prison and probably from, um, from a Roman prison, which, is, which was his first time actually in prison for sharing the gospel 
of Jesus, for preaching the good news of Jesus. So he's writing to them from prison. He doesn't know when he's going to get out. He doesn't really know what is going to happen to him. And I love the book of Philippians because in there, I see things about Paul that really, and his heart for Jesus, that really resonate with me, that really excite me. And one of the things he says is that for, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. And what he's saying there, he said, he's saying to them, the, this church in Philippi, which he really loves because they've been real partners with him in the spreading of the good news of Jesus. He's saying to them, you know what, I'd rather uh, go and be with the Lord. It's better to go and be with the Lord. In other words, he said, I'd rather die and go to be with the Lord. And we sang that um, song, didn't we, about go, going to be with Jesus and, and, and he has, he's waiting for us and there's a mansion and so on. And you could feel the expectancy within, within you all rise as we sang that and we applauded the Lord as we sang that because that's our heart, isn't it? We want to be with the Lord. We want to be with Jesus. We want to be free of pain and suffering and difficulties and want and all that sort of stuff. We want to be with Jesus in heaven, in before the throne, worshipping him and worshipping the Father and worshipping the Holy Spirit, surrounded with myriads of angels, surrounded with the hosts of people who, who love Jesus, enjoying the new heavens and the new earth and, and so on, and, no, and not having to struggle with wrinkles anymore and... Um, and sagging bits and pieces and, and so on. I, I just don't know about all that. Anyway, we can't wait for the perfect to come, can we not? And, um, and you could really feel that in that song as, as we sang. And Paul says, I'd rather die and go be with the Lord. But he said, but for your sake, say for your sake, for your sake. I, ch I choose to stay on the earth. Why? So I can encourage you and others in your faith, in your confidence, in your trust in Jesus. And in our text, we read of them, we read of him encouraging them to live in a way that as a church will cause Jesus' love and power to be seen in their city, in their community. All right, so what I want to do is I want to explore our text and see how it applies to us, if it applies to us as Shekinah, and some of what I say will not apply to those of you who are elderly or do not have good health or both. Vision of the church. What's the vision of Shekinah? It's this. Seeking the presence of God, bringing hope to all. Let's say that together. Seeking the presence of God, bringing hope to all. Seeking the presence of God. The palpable presence of God we must pursue with one mind and one spirit. Say that with me. One mind and one spirit. The palpable presence of God. We don't want people to, we don't want to be a people who are all in our heads. We don't want to be a people who talk about Jesus, talk about what he does, talk about what he says, talk about what he thinks, and, that, and that's it. We're not deists. We're not people who believe that God, there is a God, and he, but he's a distant God and he doesn't care to interact with us today. We believe that our God is, is the creator of heaven and earth. His name is Jesus and he loves interacting with us today. He loves getting into our lives, into our situations, walking with us, dwelling with us. And so if that is the case, then basically we ought to be able to sense his presence. We ought to be able to sense his presence. Now, I love the word palpable, you see, because I prefer it to the word the tangible, because palpable it means you, can't, you see, but you don't see. You hear, but you don't hear. You touch, but you can't touch. And I love that because in him we live and move and have our being, says, says, says the Bible. And so how can we see everything of God? How can we hear everything God? How can we touch everything? How can we hold God? He's so big. But he allows us 
to see him and to hear him, to do, according to our faith, our trust, our confidence, into, and according to what we can bear. <laughs> you know, goodness is wonderful, isn't it? And God is good. But you know, goodness can be overpowering. Uh, hello? Goodness can be overpowering. And God loves us so much that he doesn't want us to be overpowered by him. He wants us to be able to enjoy him and walk in relationship with him. And there'll, there'll come a day, you see, when we'll have a resurrection body, when we go to see him, and, uh, and we won't be overpowered <laughs> by him because this body is made in such a way for us so that we can stand in his glorious presence. Oh, gosh. I, I, I just so love the palpable presence of God. Now, but as we pursue God's presence... And, and how does that work? How does that work? How, how does it work? What powerful presence? How does it work? Do you know what? Let me just root, nail it a bit. When I come here on a Sunday, I love seeing you and I love hearing you, but I want to see and hear Jesus. And if I go home and I don't believe I've encountered the reality of Jesus, then I'm badly disappointed. And that's nothing to do with you. It's just the fact that I love Jesus. And the church should be the place where you find Jesus. And whenever I go into a situation and I encounter Jesus, I sense Jesus, I see him, I hear him, I feel him, I think, whoa, this is what it's all about. We went, a number of years ago, we went to uh, Texas, Houston, to T.D. Jake's church. And, the, and that's it's a mega church. It has a church of about 30,000 people. That's what it was in those days. I don't know what it is now, but 30,000. And, um, and they meet uh, in different sites, I think. But the all, main auditorium seated at that time, according to my understanding, 17,000 people. And so we walk in and I sit there. And I understand that with 17,000 people, Darby, you can get a certain amount of energy, can't you? I mean, with 17,000 people, you can, you, you, can, you, can, you can feel like something's happening, all right? And so we're sitting amongst all these people, and I'm thinking, right, I can feel the energy of 17,000 people. I can feel the focus of 17,000. We can move some stuff here, just us being together, near enough 17,000 people. And I said, Lord, now I want to experience you. Now I want to feel your presence. Now I want to sense you. And suddenly I could see him, sense him. Suddenly I could feel him. I could tell you what the presence of the people were like, something like that, but then I could tell you what the presence of Jesus felt like. Tangible, palpable presence of God. Now, Paul says, I want you to be of, if we're going to pursue God, we have to be of one mind and one spirit. What's our understanding of one? Let's be interactive quickly. What's our understanding of one? Anybody? What's your understanding of one? We need to be of one mind and one spirit if we are going to pursue the palpable presence of God. Anybody? One is, as one? As one? And in what? You, whole. So we need to be a, as a whole. A whole. That would speak of being together. Yeah. Okay, great, to be together. Anybody else? Thank you. I think I'm just going to nab whatever somebody just shouted. I was going to say the same, united. Okay, so, so we need to be united to be t together. Yeah, and, and to be with people of one mind, it, it's very similar, isn't it, to be together because you notice the difference when you might be with people that are not of the same mind. Okay, so we need to be in agreement. Yeah. Yeah. So together, in agreement, so not keeping the circle small, but make sure that circle can be entered into with, with people who have got the same value, same understanding. Very good, thank you, excellent. Jean? From one source. One source, looking in one direction to receive what you're, what you're to receive. Yes, Linda? A, a singular intent. A singular intent. You see, I love this word one more than unity 
to be honest with you. Jesus said, I pray, Father, that they be one as we are one. Because one speaks of all that you have just said, which is a state of being. Now, unity, we can, have, we can disagree about uh, football, but when the, when the, and the good, and how, how good football is or isn't, and then, but when there is, uh, when um, England are playing a, a game, we can, for the sake of our nation, come together and be united in a, regarding watching that match and, si- and desiring to see England win. And then after that, we go back to our disagreement on whether football is a good thing or not. <laughs> Okay, you can be united for a particular thing, united for a particular event, etc. But oneness is more than that, Marina. It's bigger. It's a state of being that you remain in. All right? And so we need to be one if we, in mind and in spirit, if we are going to pursue the presence of God. So as a church, how does our infrastructure enable us to pursue the habitation of God? So if we've got this lofty ideal, this lofty goal, all right, this lofty vision, as if we're going to walk in it, then we need to have an infrastructure as a church which will enable us, empower us to pursue. Not that you see, you can have infrastructures of organizations which hold against, stop you from fulfilling the vision, stop you from moving forward, and that can be so frustrating. So what, how does our infrastructure enable us to pursue the habitation of God? Well, our first thing I want to remind us of the importance of is our life groups. Life groups, say that together, life groups. What are our life groups? They are inten- intentional, accountable relationships based on trust. That's why as leadership team, we don't arrange you into these life groups because we can't make you trust somebody. You have to choose to trust somebody. And trust is built over time. I love the fact that some, sometimes people have been in this church 17 years before they've entered into a life group. I have no problem with that. It says quite a lot in many ways, but I still have no problem with it. Because the most important thing is that trust is established. And trust is built. And then we can start relating. relating. And so we have these relationships where two uh, to five people getting together once a month, maybe once a week, maybe once every six weeks, whatever, maybe two or three times a week. It's whatever you feel is right. And what you're doing there is you are um, confessing your... difficulties with one another, confessing mistakes, uh, praying for one another, sharing what you're learning from the, from the Bible, and sharing what you believe God is, you know, is saying, and praying for things that concern uh, you all as, as a group. The idea of these groups is to help you to walk in holiness, because without holiness, it says in the book of Hebrews, we cannot see God. And we're all about seeing God. All right, we're all about seeing God in reality and in truth. And so, and so the whole, our life groups are designed to help us to um, pursue the habitation of God. Our encounter meeting on a Tuesday is designed to help us to pursue the habitation of God. It's where we get together not to bring a list of stuff of what we would like God to do, but it is to bring, to bring to God our praise, to bring to Him our gratitude, to bring to Him our thanksgiving, to minister to Him, to join the angels as they cry, Holy, 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 holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. That's we're joining in with them, as Glyn was saying. We're not on our own. We're jo- joining in with others, ministering to God, giving Him praise, giving worship. And as we do that, so we expect to hear His voice. Now, that, uh, you know, and I underline that. We expect to, because He is real. We expect to hear Him l- uh, give us direction of how to intercede for our community and to give di- communities that we come from and to give us direction um, for life. Now, 
The encounter meeting is the machinery room of the church. Everything that we do comes out of that. All right? It's so important. And, uh, and recently you demonstrated you had a heart for that. Because the, the machinery room is hard to maintain. Because it's where a lot of work goes on. All right? And so, and, and, and recently you demonstrated you had a heart for it. I stood up here at the end of last year and I said, right, you know, just remind you of the encounter meeting coming up and so on. And, uh, and, and the room was full. There was over 20 of us turned up. And I thought, fantastic. And then I said to someone, watch now how the numbers drop off. Because I've been around a long time and I've been your pastor a long time. And I know what you like. <laughs> and so the numbers dropped off. What was demonstrated there? The de what was demonstrated is that you have a heart to minister to the Lord. You have a heart to pray. We have a heart to encounter God. But we lack the discipline to maintain it. Okay? It's hard sometimes, isn't it? When the wind's blowing... And it's dark. It's cold. I love my open fire. Crispin has joined me lately. He's at last had the revelation of the importance of having an open fire. We love our open fire. It clings to us. You know, sometimes we get tired, don't we? We're just tired. We've worked all day, you know, and, uh, and, it's, and tired. Sometimes we don't feel very well, you know, uh, you know etc. Oh, all right, somebody else will be there. I don't need to be there. And it's, oh, God, I can't do that. Yeah, try that. And then when the spring comes and the sun's going, oh, I feel good. I can come out and do things. And you come out and you do things and you come along and it's great. And then, and then something happens that to do in the, ho in the house, something gets your attention, you get distracted, and you think, oh, I'll catch up with that a bit later on. I'll do this this Tuesday, and I'll catch up in, with the, the cats meeting in a, a week or two's time. And then you get into a habit of putting it off, and putting it off, and putting it off, and putting it off. And before you know it, you've been once in 12 months, or maybe twice in 12 months. Now, I'm not talking about those of us who are uh, elderly and those who are struggling with sickness. I'm not talking to, the, to you guys. I'm talking to those of us who have got some energy and there's not too much wrong with us. And I want to encourage you to be a bit more disciplined this year and so that, that so you fulfill the intention of your heart which is to pursue the presence of God. Because there's a dynamic occurs that when we come together that does not occur when we're on our own. You see, God is a good, good father and he loves it when his children come together. And he says, where two or three are gathered, Jesus says, I'm in the midst. Now, it isn't about the number two or three. How many times we've heard people say, well, it's two or three, so one, two, three, it's all right, I can stay in my home. No, that's not what Jesus is saying. He's saying, when you gather, I'm there. I'm waiting for you. When the wind's blowing, he's there. When it's icy and on the road, he's there. Well, you know, he never ties and he never gets on. He's thinking, oh, that's all right. He's God, isn't it? Yeah, well, I agree with you. Yeah, Because yeah. <laughs> it ain't always easy to get, up, get out the door. But he's always waiting for us. All right? And so I want to encourage you as we... to. In get to the encounter meetings as we, uh, which are designed to enable us to pursue the habitation of God. Wednesday morning prayer, 7 to 8 a.m. Come on, 7 to 8 a.m. I wasn't there last week. I, my bed wouldn't let me go, Laurie. I said, get down bed in Jesus' name, but it wouldn't get down. It kept, you know, the duvet was, you know, and Lib was hanging on, I tell you. 7 to 8 a.m. On, a, on, you know, just to come to, to minister, to pray, and then to go to work. 
And uh, it used to be a men's meeting. But, but in lockdown, we got rid of that and said, the, you women can come. And it was classic. Two or three women came for two, three weeks, and then they didn't come anymore. <laughs> you know? But you're so welcome. You're so welcome to come and pray together and, uh, and to hear God together. Really important. Again, they're part of our infrastructure to help us in our pursuit of the presence of God. Connect groups happen Wednesday, 11 a.m. on a Wednesday in the morning up here. Once a month on a Tuesday at 7.30. At Jewish sages say, say this. Worship begins with two, when two or three gather together to open up the scripture and there you'll find the Shekinah. So we gather in those meetings to, to go over what we've heard on the Sunday, to, 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 to get some more dominoes going in our thinking, to share how it's made us think and how, it, how it's made us feel, the teaching that we've heard on, from Scripture on the Sunday. And then we pray and, and we worship God together and the presence of God is there. I want to encourage you to, uh, you know, if you're able to on a Wednesday at 11 a.m. to come along. Um, and, if you, and if you can't because you're busy working, then that's why we've started the Tuesday once a month at 7.30 so that you can come along to that and, uh, and, and study God's Word w with others and go over it and, and listen and learn and from one another. And Jesus is right in the midst of us. All right. Breakfast and theology for the men and for the women. These two groups are totally different. When, you, when the men get together, they have their breakfast at breakfast time, 8 a.m. And, and, we, and, we, and we debate the Word of God. And, uh, and, and it's, some of it is really good and some of it's out. <laughs> anyway, no, it's great. It's all good. But, it, but, but the weird and the wonderful come out. Now, the women, you, do, you, you gather at 9 you gather for brunch, I think. And, uh, and then you have your continental breakfast. There's no meat there. There's a question whether you're saved. Anyway, but you have your bre continental breakfast. <laughs> you have your continental breakfast. And then, and then you gather around the Word of God. Now, I, ga I understand that uh, apparently that, uh, you know, you, you go at it different to us, you know. There's a lot of ministry and uh, praying with one another and weeping and, and wailing and all the rest of it. And it, and it, and it, and it sounds really good. But, but in all of this, these things, you're gathering around the Word and giving it some time. A Saturday morning to gather around the Word. And Jesus is right in the midst of us, teaching us what He looks like, teaching us what He sounds like, showing us what, 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 what His heart is about. Tremendous. Well, the second thing our vision is about is bringing hope to all. Let's say that together. Bringing hope to all. Our text says this, that, that Paul writes to the Philippians and says we should be striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. Let's say that together. We should be striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. One more time. We should be striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. The word striving in Greek is a translation of the Greek word used for an athletic contest. All right. So in other words, a team of athletes working in perfect coordination against an opposing team. That's the, what it is to strive. That's what God's calling us to do. He's saying, be athletes. <laughs> All right. Be athletes. Have an athlete's mentality and stand together and work in perfect coordination against that which is opposing you, the enemy and the, world's, and the world's spirit. So, purchase, how do we bring hope to, how are we bringing hope to all? First of all, we need to understand that we need to be standing together as athletes, that we're an athletic team. We're fit, you say, in the spirit. Fit according to the things of God. 
totally focused on God's plans and purposes for us and for the extension of his kingdom in West Cornwall. And we're together in it. And we're going to take on whatever comes against that the glory of Jesus being seen in West Cornwall. We'll take it on. And we're together in that. Are you with me? Yeah. That's what he's saying. Yeah. Practically, how does that work? First, the purchase of the building. This building is a tool which will enable us to have greater impact in West Cornwall as we appeal to people to put their trust, their faith in Jesus. It's going to enable us to reach out further. It's going to enable us to do bigger things, far things that reach further into the midst of our communities and where we come from. Now, we need to pray continually for the trustees as they engage in the, with the admin for purchasing the building and seek to move forward with wisdom in the face of challenges and difficulties. All right? Because there are. There always are. And how much more there are when things, people are trying to do things for, for God's kingdom. And as a congregation, we need to make sure we are ready to commit our time our energy and finance the Lord has given us into purchasing and renovating this building so it continues to be an effective tool in the years that are to come. We have also a time for church services. What are they about? They are about a shorter service. You say, yay, right? where we can bring our friends, people that we've been witnessing to, people that we've been sharing the good news of Jesus with, where they can come and hear a gospel message, you know, a short message about Jesus. And then afterwards, we can have some treats together, some food together, some nice things together, etc. And so where people can experience the family of God what it feels like to be in the midst of Christians who love Jesus, where they can sense his presence, and, uh, and, and, and we can revel in the simple gospel message. That's so important. We've been running time for church services for years, decades now. And we have seen so many people become Christians through that service. It's absolutely tremendous. And once again, Linda, thank you for arranging the hospitality in all its various forms. What else have we got within our infrastructure to enable us to bring hope to all? The Alpha Course. The Alpha Course, so important. You know, Nigel and Amanda have such a passion for the Alpha Course. It pleases my heart, guys. All right? Just to gather people, to open their homes, and uh, to gather people, to, to hear the gospel, to, you know, over food, a, a safe place created so that people can ask any question they want about Jesus and not be embarrassed. Wonderful. And we've had seen so many people's lives touched um, over the years through the Alpha Course. So many people get saved. So many, and some people not get saved, but they've encountered something of God and they've decided not to follow him. But that's fine. They know that he exists. Absolutely wonderful. And, uh, and I'd love to give some time over to Nigel Turner to come and speak. But if I do that, I know I'll not get the microphone back. So no, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> the Hope Project. Say it with me. The Hope Project. Hope Project. The Hope Project. So important to enable us to bring hope to all. People who are down, people who are out, people who fall in between the cracks, people falling on hard times, you know, don't have enough money, don't have the know-how to set up a, their home. Here comes the Hope Project. Hope Project, not giving second-hand fridges, not giving second-hand washing machines, not giving second-hand cookers, not giving second-hand carpet, not giving second-hand curtains or curtain rail, etc., but giving a brand new at no cost whatsoever to the client. No agenda, but just blessing them 
with that, with that, to help with stuff that they need to get going again in life. And also being able, Hope Project, to have been work hand in hand with Gopher, Gopher who does good quality second hand as well. You know, there's a working together there, which is good and right. And so that again brings hope. So people say, why would you do this? Why would you give me a new washing machine? Why would you give me a, a new fridge? Why would you give me a new cookie? Wh wh can I give you something for it? No, we don't want anything. What do you mean you don't want anything? You know, we've had some people come to church from the Hope Project, right? Who've been affected by the Hope Project. And they've come for two or three weeks and then, and then they're gone. You know why they've come? It's because they've come just to say thank you. You know, they come to just to say thank you. And then some have come and, and they've got saved and, and, and so on. But, you know, a number have come just to say thank you because they feel so encouraged, feel so blessed. We haven't asked them to come. They've chosen to come and that's okay. But with, they've experienced something of the goodness of God. And it's us that makes that possible because out of that which we have give, God has given us so we sow into serving the community and help people who are in need. Well, thank you, Claire, for all these years. Oh, I know, but we thank you. I know. As a good leader, she likes to make sure her team is acknowledged. But you see, if you don't have a good leader, the team can't function. And so take the praise today. And well done, the rest of her team, for serving clear in this. Well, what about our quiz and food nights? Oh, food again. Here it comes again. <laughs> food, 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 food. Really important. Really important. Why is food so important? Food's so important because without food, we can't live. Without food, we don't have energy. Without food, we don't have strength. Without food, we won't maintain life. But you see, food is just a shadow. Our physical food is just a shadow. Jesus is the bread of life. And we need to eat of him. So we need to eat of him spiritually and have physical food as well. Okay, then we are living. All right. Then we're alive. And so anyway, our quiz nights, got people where again we can invite our friends, invite our people we're witnessing to, invite family that don't know Jesus to come and have some fun. God is into fun. Jesus, Jesus is a laughing God. He laughs. I tell you, there's so many jokes in Scripture, and uh, you know, it's absolutely, you know, it's tremendous. It's just that sometimes we struggle to see that a joke's been made because of the because it's because we don't have a Middle Eastern mindset. But it's there. And, uh, you know, and, and, and I remember years ago there was a um, um, uh, uh, Jesus film came out. And, he, and, and this, Jesus, this actor had short curly hair. And he was laughing every time he was doing, do, I don't know, maybe it was a gospel called Matthew, I think it was called. And it was, he was just laughing all the time. And I remember looking at it and I thought, and looking at how he, how he um, portrayed Jesus and, uh, from his understanding of Scripture. And I thought, yeah, you aren't far wrong, mate. You're all right. Yeah, you've got something there. He really caught that God who's got, has a sense of humor. And so we want to be able to, to gather people that we are witnessing to, that we are sharing the love of God with, to come and say, come and laugh with us. Come and have some fun with us. We, we do a lot of laughing in this house, you know. It's good. I mean, we've got Chris Spittlehouse. I mean, he's constantly going around <laughs> pretending he's engaging you in a proper conversation, a meaningful, spiritual conversation of depth, and then it just turns out to be another joke. Do you know what I mean? I mean, you know, but, but it's a gift from God he, 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 he has. And we are blessed to be able to hear him, you know, and uh, because God wants us to laugh. To have clean fun. Clean. He never says a swear word, does Chris? Apparently some comedians say, if you're struggling for a laugh, just, just drop the F word and you'll get a laugh. Why is it that we laugh when the F word is dropped in this country? Is it because we're embarrassed? Or do we really find it funny? Take that home, think it through for yourself. But, you know, we don't need to do that. And Chris never drops the F-bomb at all, you know, as he, as he makes us laugh with his jokes. It's just wonderful. 
And so we invite people to our quiz night, and Nigel, the quiz master, and, and I think Nigel Turner's been a quiz master, and I think Crispin might have been a quiz master at some time, you know, whatever. If he hasn't been, I'm sure he'll be in the future. Anyway, but a quiz master! <laughs> quiz master! Absolutely tremendous! And, and Nigel Clark, you know, and all the rest do a tremendous job. And then we eat food, we have that food, those wonderful curries, and now it's going to be a Mexican night. And, uh, you know, I'm not fussy, I'll just stick with the curry, but you see, but Linda will pander to your fussiness and bring some more variety in. But, you know, food! We gather around the food and we laugh, we spend time, Steve, you're looking well on it. You know, it's just tremendous, you know? And we sense God's presence there. And when people come in, they're surrounded with people in our midst. They're surrounded with people who love them, who care, and who are not nosy about where they come from, what they're doing, what their failures and mistakes. We're just enjoying them for who they are. Well, what else do we have which enables us to, in our infrastructure to bring hope to all? Fun day. The fun day. Free fun day. Every year. Free bouncy castles, free barbecue, free, everything's free. free. What else do we do on there? Fa free face painting. What else? What else? Kids, kids crafts. Yeah, kids crafts, free. It's all free. And they come in their hundreds to it. And they don't understand why we're doing it for free. But we tell them because we just want to give you a good time. And their eyes light up. And then we'll tell, we'll tell them also that, you know, this is a demonstration of Jesus' love for you. Tremendous. We go out giving out leaflets on the estate and they say, yeah, we're really looking forward to it. Through lockdown, uh, you know, when we couldn't do it, they, when we did it last year, they said, oh, we were waiting for you to come back. We wondered if you were going to come back again. And so we go in and we, and we say, yes, there is hope. You know, we're hoping that, that we will impart hope to them and that they'll believe that, that, that they can do something that they've never done, become someone that they've never become because they have experienced some kindness, some kindness and we don't take a penny for it. Last, la on the last uh, fun day, a woman comes up to me and she says, is this free? I said, yes. She said, I've got some money. I said, I don't want it. She said, but yeah, but yeah, but do, we could do it. I don't want your money. This is free. God loves you. This is free. Wow, she said. Wow. Well, what else do we have which helps us to bring hope to all in our infrastructure? Revive West Cornwall. Revive, revive West Cornwall. We come together with other churches, to pray for revival, to pray that God's church will be revived in the West Cornwall, to pray that there'd be an outpouring of God's spirit on his church, on his people in, in, in West Cornwall, pray that there would be miracles and signs and wonders flowing out of the different communities within God, uh, from God's churches within West Cornwall. We're praying for a spiritual awakening to come uh, in, in, people's, uh, in people's lives that don't know Jesus. We're wanting people to be flooding out their homes and coming to church to hear about Jesus. We know that the only reason why we are here is because Jesus revealed himself to us and there was a spiritual awakening in our lives. And then we saw Jesus, heard Jesus and repented of our sins and became followers of Jesus. I gave him our allegiance. Somebody somewhere was praying for us and that is why we are here today. And we are committed as churches within West Cornwall to stand in the gap and raise our hands and raise our voices together with one heart, with one mind with one focus and say Lord Jesus Christ will you pour out your Holy Spirit and would you save our neighbors just like you saved us and we're committed to doing this together with other churches numerous times in a year because we want to see our communities overflowing with the hope of God and finally, I just want to focus on this, and it might be not, not um, the only thing. I might have missed a number of things. But next generation. 
Next generation. What's the next generation? What's Hanka doing with next generation? She's seeking to create a place where young people who are Christian but also are not Christian, not Christian, can come and have a safe place. They can be warm. They can have games to play. They can have people to, to, to watch over them and take care of them and protect them so they don't have to walk the streets and so they don't have to fall into bad company but they, they can come under Christian values and uh, have a bit of chocolate and have some milkshake and, and, and so on and just a safe place, just a safe place where they can talk and share things if they so want to. So we want the kids to grow up having hope. Having hope that they can live a better than. That they can know more than. Well, Paul says to the church in Philippi that if you have the same mind and same love and are in full accord, then his joy, meaning Paul's joy, will be made complete. But you see, Paul is an ambassador of Christ, all right? He's a servant of Christ. So Jesus Christ is saying this. He is saying if Shekinah, as an expression of the Jesus Church in West Cornwall, will have the same mind, the same love, and are, are in full accord, striving together, we will complete the joy of Jesus whom we serve and truly be a church that he inhabits, that he dwells in. And all will see him. Now, I don't know about you, but that's what my life is about. People seeing and encountering Jesus. So this year, let's be diligent in a way that we've never been before. Let's put the effort in, in a way that we've never done before. Let's go for it. Let's go for it. People are waiting to hear about Jesus. They're waiting to encounter him. And we have the wonderful privilege of revealing him to them. You see, we're not a cozy club. You're not here because you want to be in a nice club where the singing is nice and the people are nice. Oh, if you are, you're missing it. Glad you're here, but you're missing the point. The point is, we're here to tell people about Jesus. We've been called together in this part of the world to tell people about Jesus. And I have two neighbours either side of me before Christmas who died. One of them I was able to bring to hear John Archer, the comedian, the event that we put on as a church. He came and he listened to John Archer. Amanda Turner told him off because he was rustling papers and talking and all the rest of it, etc. And she was right to turn him, to tell him off. But he was there. And I was able to pray with him when he, and, uh, and take him to hospital at times. And when he f fell in the streets, I was, I was there to be able to pick him up, you know, etc. And he died. He was found in his bed around Christmas time, 62 but because of you, he heard Jesus. Because of you, he encountered something of Jesus. And I pray that in his last few seconds, before his spirit left his body, that he would have yielded to Jesus Christ. And then the other neighbor, 80 odd, who's died. Well, she wasn't ever interested in Jesus. I couldn't get through to her about Jesus. Even the local vicar of the parish that we live in couldn't get through to her. But it wasn't the one to try. 
Everybody's got a choice. But do you understand this? That we are here together, being called by God to be together because there are those out there who will say yes to Jesus. We're here for them. So come on. Let's be a bit more diligent. Okay? So that the presence of God can be seen in our midst. You wonderful, wonderful, wonderful people.